All right, I'll get started. Can everyone hear me? Okay, cool. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Piali, and I am a software engineer on the V3 Acceleration team based in San Francisco. Um, and welcome to the panel discussion on welcoming V3, modernizing the Cloud Foundry API. Um, so here with me, we have a set of amazing panelists. So I'd like to take a minute for them to introduce themselves. It'd be great. Hello. Oh, there it works. Uh, hi, I am Zach Robinson. Um, I'm a, a longtime contributor to Cloud Foundry. I've been doing it for about six years. Um, so worked on, on the cloud controller and the API for quite a while. And uh, right now I work in product at Pivotal. Hey, everyone. I'm Abby Chow. I'm the current CFCLI PM and also V3 Acceleration Team co-PM. Um, I started on the CFCLI about April of 2018. Um, you, some of you might know me from GitHub issues, where I apologize in advance. <laughs> so. uh, hi, I'm Reed Mitchell. I'm also an engineer on the V3 Acceleration team. Uh, prior to this, I was on the Apps Manager team, working on, uh, working, you know, on the pivotal closed source front end to uh, the cloud controller. So. So um, the whole idea for this panel and why I thought it would be interesting to make it a panel rather than a project update session is because I feel like there are several sides to the story of modernizing an API. There's the side of the people who are actually developing the API, and there's also the end users. Um, and I thought this would be a great platform for people to come, especially who are in teams that are looking to update from V2 to V3 and to hopefully answer questions that they might have. So before I go into this, I was just wondering what who you all are, who are the audience. So who in the audience, raise your hand if you are in a team that is looking to switch to V2 to V3 or are in the currently in the process of doing so. Yeah, very cool. And raise your hand if you are looking to be a contributor to the API itself. Yeah, cool. Um, and yeah, and raise your hand. And I just wanted to know for people who didn't raise their hands, if anyone would want to share uh, what other connection they have to the V3 API. Okay, others. <laughs> no, that's okay. Great. Great. So going in, first, I thought it would be interesting to explore the history or the reason of why there is a need for a V3 in the first place. Um, so Zach, I will ask you the question first, as you're one of the founding fathers of V3, <laughs> you can say. Um, so why V3? What were the pain points that needed to be addressed? Yeah, uh, th I mean, there was really quite a number of them. Um, uh, it goes from from the implementation of, of the API itself, um, as well as the, the the structure of the presentation of it and the way you interact with it. Um, so we can kind of start maybe with how you interact with it, because maybe that that's the more interesting bit. Um, when we look at at early cloud, so a lot of you probably interacted with just the CLI, and, and maybe you, you don't see uh, some of the underpinnings. But I know there's quite a few folks out there that um, they'll find that maybe when I when I CF push, I actually don't want to just type CF push. I want to um, upload a package, and then I need to validate that, uh, get, a, get a checksum and put that into my, um, my tooling to make sure when I do change control that I, you know, everything flows through. And um, there's various steps to kind of handle that. And so people will build tooling uh, that interacts directly with the API. Uh, and where we started with the API was, was essentially, there was one. It was just v2 slash app. That was the API, and it was the only thing you could interact with. Um, so it became hard to do sort of granular, smaller operations. And we found as we wanted to do more things uh, and orchestrate more things um, that we've been able to do today, for example, where we can do rolling deploys because we orchestrate a couple of processes. Um, what we needed to do was take the app object and break it down into smaller parts. Um, and so that was, that was sort of really early on the impetus for what we needed a V3 API for and why we were going to um, do a large breaking change. Um, the other part being the implementation under the hood um, was a really interesting homegrown uh, conglomeration of uh, Sinatra, a Ruby Sinatra app, um, as well as uh, some, some sort of metaprogramming, uh, such that basically what happened is you would generate an API that looked exactly like your, your database table, uh, and it would be a one-to-one -one mapping. 
Uh, and there wasn't a lot of room in there to, to build out any interesting workflows. You just, you just dumped the database. Um, so there was a desire to use something more canonical, um, in the Ruby world at least, just let's make it Rails. Um, and let's clean up some of the stuff to make it a lot simpler for people to onboard and, and use tooling that's just part of the community and well understood. Great. And I'm happy you actually talked about the onboarding experience because that's where my next question leads. Um, so Reed, I'm going to direct this question to you. What was it like in the onboarding experience to this, um, uh, to VAT especially, um, and also discussing the V3 architecture and how the onboarding experience was affected by that? Sure, yeah. So I rolled onto the V3 acceleration team uh, five-ish months ago, uh, and I had not really looked at the V2 cloud controller code base at all, so I sort of jumped right in looking at the V3 code base, and um, so I can sort of speak to my experience getting accustomed to it. Um, I can say that it didn't take very long to get used to it, uh, which I think is, is a good thing for talking about, for thinking about external contributors or, you know, other teams uh, diving into the code base, but, uh, you know, it's sort of roughly split into controllers, um, Maybe maybe these terms will be familiar to you all. Uh, <laughs> if you're familiar with Rails, we've got controllers and actions, uh, jobs for asynchronous uh, operations that are done by the API, um, presenters for constructing the JSON responses that we send back. Um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. But I can I I want to emphasize that. Uh, it didn't take very long to get up to speed with it, and I think it was thanks to the work that the people who came before me on the team did to or, sort of architect it cleanly. And um, also, I next we wanna move and talk about the new features about V3, because V3 is not only about uh, transforming the legacy code to more readable and easy to develop on um, architecture, but it's also about new features that are being added. So, I'm going to direct this question to Zach and Reed about new V3 only features. So, let's start. Uh, well, Zach mentioned the idea of breaking up the app into multiple processes. I think a lot of the uh, new resources that you'll see in V3 compared to V2 sort of come out of that idea of breaking, breaking up uh, workflows into smaller parts, more granular parts. So we've got Process, the process object, um, and uh, we've got this concept of a deployment re resource, which represents an app transitioning from one state to another. Um, and these are things that are enabling, as Zach mentioned, the uh, new rolling deployment feature, where you have a new web process of an app spinning up uh, instances while the old web process is spinning down. Uh, the goal is to have zero downtime for your web process, which is enabled by the new architecture in V3. Cool. Yeah, I think I think that the the key point that that's been interesting to me is is the goal of focus on building blocks, make the smallest things you can, build them up, uh, and so for us that you know we we go back to processes and and that's that that's really often at the core of it because that that's what represents your running object. Um, I want ten of these things and I want it to run. This, this bit of code. Um, and once you have those uh, and you keep it really small, you, you can build on that. Um, and so like, like Reed mentioned, you know, you have deployments, which all they do really is they think about, let me create a process, let me spin up, let me add instances to a process, let me remove instances from a process. But at the end of the day, it's just orchestrating something that's already there. Um, I look at uh, what we're doing, we're, we're adding some sidecar support. Um, and it, it's a similar thing. We can add a new object called sidecar, um, which really looks a lot like a process, which is nice because we already have that, and you can correlate it to a running process. Um, so it's just another way of taking the building blocks. We glue them together, um, and we're able to build more and more interesting things. Um, I think what, what's also like really powerful about sort of building it up that way is when you have the building blocks, sure, you can build APIs um, that users can grab that can do that orchestrate these rolling deployments um, but you don't have to use the built-in ones. You can now use those building blocks yourself as well. Um, so if you don't want to um, use exactly the rolling deploy 
you know, build in logic, you could instead generate a couple of processes and scale them up and down however you see fit or route to them um, in different ways. Uh, so I, I think that's that's the real key to sort of how we've thought about it is, is that building block pattern and then always thinking how do you layer on top of that and layer more and more behavior um, while not making it necessary to use each step you can you can use the building block as you see fit very cool so now that we have a great understanding of the new features of v3 um, I, I, the reason why I have invited Abby to be part of this panel is because as the PM of CLI team, she has a unique experience on, or a, new, a unique perspective on the end user side of things. So I wanted to ask you, Abby, about what the experience was like to adapt to V3 or to plan for V7, which is the new version of the CLI, which, whose end goal is to only use V3 endpoints. Yeah, thanks. I, I think there's like some interesting history on the CLI side. Um, 2008 time period, I think the sort of strategy was to do a logic switch. So if you're on V2, we'll detect that and bring you to the V2 code base. If V3, we'll bring you to V3. Um, sort of early on, we noticed like there was a bunch of pain points there. Number one, our customer, Cappy, was telling us that you know in, integrating with the CLI using V3 was extremely difficult and painful for, for the product and engineering. Um, and then um, about June of 2018, we tried to integrate the first command to switch over to V3, um, CF app. So this was the first logic switch that we did. If you had V3, we would show you the V3 display of app. And we found that you know all our assumptions and um, pain points were validated. It was very difficult for product engineering and end users, you you folks, um, to actually you know partake in using the feature and for us to develop it product side and engineering wise. So the V3 acceleration team developed out of this because we thought, what is the best way to move forward? We can't move forward with the logic switch because we know that's painful. Um, we're going to major bump the V7 CLI and. We, you know, most of you folks know we haven't had a major bump of the CLI for about five years. So there's considerations here. Like how do we major bump um, and do this kind of more internal effort to support CAPI and for you folks to actually get the V3 uh, features. So we decided um, after getting some feedback to not break as much as possible. And that's difficult, right? Because we know that you folks are using um, CLI in your pipelines and it's been in use for five years. So you might have scripts um, sort of uh, looking at the output or scripting against the output. So we were really careful on the V3 side. I think, you know, when I, we, the first anchor on the team, I think we had this joke about we're supposed to move fast and don't break anything. And that was like one of our actual goals because we wanted you folks to be able to upgrade um, as seamlessly as possible. Um, it's, a, it's been about a year now, so in reality that hasn't actually happened. Like we have had a couple of breaking changes where we removed flags or commands, but we did so intentionally and we've documented every single break. Um, so, you know, everything that we've done has been intentional and also, you know, it might not seem like it, but we're thinking of end users, you folks, like how will you upgrade and use the CLI? Um, so in terms of new features, we strategically decided not to add features to V6. Um, so there's features like rolling deployments that you can find as a experimental feature on V6, but um, we decided to support it on V7. So you'll find um, rolling deployments, um, what Reed and, and Zach mentioned, on V7. Um, it's going to be a new flag on push. It's available now, so you can download the latest V7 and use it. Please provide feedback to us. We're hoping for some feedback. Um, metadata is also a feature that's only on V7. And then we have a host of features, sidecars, uh, like Zach mentioned, that will be on V7 only. So very strategically, we're placing everything on V7 so you folks can give us feedback and, and then adopt it. Great. So basically, existing behavior should be the same in V3. And then there are some exciting new V3 resources that are also being supported in the CLI. And um, along with all of this newness in V3, there comes a need for proper documentation for these things. So, Reed, would you like to talk a little bit about how the V3 API documentation is different, new features in it as well? Uh, yeah, so in the, in the year and a half that I spent on the Apps Manager team, I spent a lot of that time digging through both the V2 API docs and the V3 API docs, so I got sort of familiar with uh, the structure and 
I can say that the V3 API, API docs are much easier to navigate. I don't know if you've all had a chance to look at both of them and compare, um, <laughs> but uh, I hope that you agree. And um, also, since I've joined this team, we've made an effort to make small improvements to the V3 API docs, like improving the load time, improving the search feature on there, um, just kind of generally being more descriptive and clear in our language that we use in the documentation. Um, so I think we're focused on discoverability, um, you know, the, the making sure like things aren't split across tons of different pages and hard to find. I don't know if you've seen the V2 docs, but it's, it's sort of hard to find the, the endpoint that you're looking for. Um, and uh, we're focused on enabling client authors to easily find what they're looking for um, as they're developing clients. Um, yeah, but I would, uh, I think we would really be, we would love to hear feedback on the V3 docs. It, we would be open to exploring how to improve them in any, in any way that we could. So if you want to talk about that, I would love to talk about that. <laughs> sure. Uh, just one thing to kind of add, I guess, it, it's nice to talk about docs and say, sure, we think they're better. Um, I, I think so, it, it's interesting to think about if, you know, if, if you all are building APIs or you're consuming APIs, um, some of the switch that happened on like how we think about um, documentation and somewhere, you know, we, we talked about the V3 acceleration team, which maybe a lot of you haven't even heard of, but um, there's some interesting stuff about how we're, how we're working with the CLI and the API teams together that's maybe worth a little discussion. Um, so kind of in our, in our V2 world, we actually just auto-generated docs and said, whatever got generated, those are good enough, they'll be fine, right? People will figure it out. Um, and in the V3 world, we said, you know, that, that's good, maybe we'll generate as much as we can. But in fact, these things are super important. People can't use an API without documentation. It's a real, real pain in the butt. Um, so we take that in as um, a real part of the product. So every time you develop an API, auto-generate as much as you can, but then go and review, add stuff by hand, whatever you need to do. Maybe describe workflows of how to use an API, not just like this is this endpoint, but maybe it's this endpoint works well with this endpoint, and together you can create this sort of workflow. Um, so those were some sort of changes we took. Um, Maybe another thing that's worth talking about is the, the V3 acceleration. Um, this, is, this is an offshoot of the, the API team and the CLI teams, um, where instead of sort of working separately, they're, they're really sitting next to each other and working together. Um, and this is really ensuring that, you know, it seems pretty obvious, right? But um, you have a CLI, which is a client, a consumer of the API. And by building them together, you make sure that these APIs are consumable and usable. Um, at the same time that you're building them and you have a chance to edit them and change them as you go. So um, that's sort of a change in thinking that, we, that we've had and sort of how we're approaching that stuff. And um, Abby, I guess you can also give, like it would be great if you could give input on like what the experience was like to work with the CAPI team in these bad efforts as well. Yeah, it's interesting when you think about um, relationship between the CLI and CAPI, there's almost like two different relationships on the V3 acceleration team. It's almost like a task force. Um, we've done a couple of features, but it's mo the main goal of the team is to just convert resources and then the CLI supports it. Um, so, you know, working in this team, we're basically integrated, like Zach mentioned, with CAPI. So, you know, there's feedback loops that we can very quickly give to CAPI. If there's an error message on the CLI that doesn't make necessarily make sense, um, on V7, we're basically returning CAPI's error messages. We're no longer wrapping the CLI message. We can easily update the CAPI side um, you know, without sort of having to go through that feedback loop. And it, it's because it's not a separate team, we're very quickly able to integrate changes. So V3, um, yeah, so V3 is a different relationship with, with the sort of the CLI team where we're developing features and we're also developing features catching up to CAPI. So metadata, for example, has been out for some time or we're still playing catch up. So that feedback loop is much longer because the feature has been out for so long. Um, but I think in general, you know, working with CAPI closely, it's been great. I think, you know, um, it's been great because it's quicker feedback um, and hopefully we'll get to a state where CAPI's pre now features and CLI can support it a lot quicker than we have um, previously. Yeah, so basically V3 is not only developing really quickly, but also we have a great example of an end user, the CLI, which we're also developing side by side. Um, another aspect of all of this is external contributors to the API. 
And I, so there's one team in London that now it's a services enablement team and they're contributing to the API in V3 style as well with services resources and service brokers as well. Um, Zach, could you talk a little bit about how that came about and the whole external contributor experience? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think like how, how that came about, uh, I mean, you know, uh, given an amount of people, you can only build so much API, um, and uh, we want to build all of it. So um, being able to get some external contributions is, is obviously really great. Um, and so being able to have a separate team that, um, instead of thinking about ownership uh, or teams around a code base, uh, you can instead think, think about areas of responsibility. Um, so we might have a team that, that, that cares deeply about applications and then they work on those APIs. Uh, but now we're able to have, have teams of folks that care really much about the service workflows and so service binding, service instances, all those sorts of things. Um, and they can have just as much essential ownership of a code base um, by contributing um, and bringing in the, those V3 um, APIs to it, which, which has been really great. And I, I thought it'd be interesting to mention them as well because the, they're basically the first team of significant contributors that Bat and Cappy have also been working really closely with. Um, and currently we're in the process of also having uh, some sessions where Vat and Cappy team members go and actually work with them and pair with them for a week just to see what the onboarding process is like. And as Reed mentioned, it's been a pretty great experience for onboarding so far. And I can say that as well in my first few weeks on VAT. Um, but yeah, the, I, basically the entire point of the V3 experience is that it is easy to develop on, and that is the reason why the modernization of the API was so essential to begin with, and hopefully you all find it useful too. Um, and with that, the last question that I have for, uh, for you all is the, what the next couple months looks like for VAT. Um, and like in terms of timeline and roadmap, because I've heard that question a lot from folks. Yeah, so winter 2020, um, we're looking at doing usage um, roles and users, um, audit events if, if time uh, allows us to. Um, and then for, for that, we're actually generally done. Um, we have maybe seven resources left. Um, they're, they're sort of remaining ones are the services side of things. I think we're, it looks like we're about 33% done on the resources side, but once users are done, that's a majority of the resources um, left to do on the VAT side. On the CLI, I think we're on about 40% um, complete. Um, and we have you know, uh, security groups left to do. Um, user-related roles and, and, and um, audit events to do. Um, but I just wanted to point out that push actually took us, as you know, push is probably the most important command, so it took us much longer to do. So it looks like, you know, once we finish push, we have one last thing to do with push, which is the diffing, which was difficult to do um, with server-side manifests. So that's the last piece for push, and once we're done with that, I, you know, it seems as though we can accelerate a little bit more quickly than we have in the last couple of months. But on the roadmap, it's diffing on push um, for V7. Um, we have the rest of the CLI, so usage and uh, roles and um, uh, security groups. Um, and then we'll be trying to help with the services enablement team to finish off the services related resources and CLI commands. Um, and on the CLI side, uh, what we're trying to hope to finish is the login refactor, which has been going on for some time, but we hope to finish to support SAP uh, for a feature that they're they're looking to add to that. Um, we're also um, going to support sidecars with the app display. Um, that's on the roadmap. And metadata. Metadata is going to take some time because there are 27 resources and, you know, six new commands that support the metadata, so that's going to be on the horizon as well. Um, there's other things we would love to do if we had the resources, which is provide some sort of scripting solution to the community so you're sort of able to sort of adopt the CLI without having sort of um, barriers in the way. Um, and there might be one or two other ones um, supporting the log aggregator team. They want to deprecate traffic controller. Um, so on v7, we're just going to use log cache and maybe support CF tail. That. So there clearly is a lot of work to be done, but we are accelerating fast, um, and we'll get it done soon by 2020, winter 2020. <laughs> uh, so yeah, now we have a little extra time, and I wanted to give an extra time at the end because I figured that the audience might have questions that they want to ask. 
So if anyone wants to ask any questions, now's the time. Yeah. Hold on, let me give you the microphone. <laughs> Hey, um, I really enjoyed using the V3 API. I've, I've been using it since the giant experimental flags popped up in the CF CLI. So, um, are there any plans to move any of the CF networking stuff into a cloud controller? Because um, you kind of revamped all of the like app objects, but network policies and things still exist on a kind of esoteric endpoint. Uh, and the CLI does a nice job of wrapping them, but if you're building any kind of client, it's still a bit weird. Yeah, that that's really uh, that, that's useful feedback. Um, I think uh, I, I don't know that we've given a ton of thought to that specifically yet. Um, it, it, networking was it was really interesting. It was sort of our first experiment in what does it look like to have a separate API server, um, and some some of the goal around that um, being that that team got to iterate really quickly. Um, and this goes back to again why why we had to make some changes. It was really difficult to get uh, your change of stuff merged into the old. Uh, API server um, code base because it was really difficult to understand and really um, complicated to to make sort of changes uh, in a way that didn't just affect everything actually, which was really interesting around uh, how it did its auto generation. So if you wanted one endpoint to maybe behave a little differently, what you might end up doing is changing every single endpoint. Um, so that's sort of some of the history of, of how this networking thing came about. Um, I think when we look at look at the networking one, um, I don't know if we would necessarily pull that one in exactly as is. I think about how we might give it um, some experience that um, is uh, a little less granular of point-to-point -point sort of rules and is more maybe like, how do I provide uh, maybe the idea of a network that I can attach spaces to or I can attach orgs to? Um, so I think um, if, we, if and when we were to pull it in, um, it might not look exactly as it is, um, but there's not an immediate uh, plan to pull it in. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Stefan from SAP, and uh, we have the challenge that we run uh, very big landscapes, and our biggest internal landscapes has actually 60 cloud controllers uh, running inside, and that's, well, is there any plan to improve the performance of the cloud controller to get it a bit cheaper? <laughs> and also the database, I mean, Running on Postgres uh, with 60 cloud controllers, you need so many connections, and that's uh, that's a challenge. Right. There's uh, only an upper size limit on on RDS, for instance. <laughs> yeah, I, I can speak to that too. There was um, some of the impetus of um, uh, swapping out again the, the, this change of V3, where it's not just you know a service level change, but a, an implementation level change. Um, we had a lot of reliance on. Um, Things this gets a little in the, into the nuts and bolts, but around event machine and thin, uh, and some older technologies um, that made it difficult for us to adopt newer Ruby web servers that, that do perform significantly better um, because of the way it was really just tightly coupled. So uh, definitely, our hope is once we are able to essentially uh, get the whole V3 thing complete in GA, um, we can rip out some of that old code and then we can start making uh, movements towards. Um, using much more performant web servers, um, and hopefully see, yeah, maybe a decrease from 60, which is which is quite a few, um, and and uh, yeah, hopefully make that better. I, I think one other thing that's interesting that the the Cappy team is doing right now is um, they're they're working on rolling out um, some ways to gather um, some telemetry back into the system so they can start understanding. Um, some of this, this will be like vendor uh, specific, but um, start understanding what are the real performance things and being able to get those um, pulled back in uh, and start being able to use that data to make better decisions about how to scale things. So that is, it is definitely the dream, but probably not uh, in the next month or two. Anyone else? Any questions? Okay. Um, well, we'll be around a little bit after if anyone wants to come up and talk to us about VAT efforts or uh, V3 features in general. Uh, so yeah, thank you all for coming. I hope that was useful for all of you. Uh, yeah, have a good rest of the summit. <laughs>